me uh, start out with uh, a reflection I've had all evening. I have been puzzled, wondering about how I was going to proceed. And so I think I'm going to take the more adventurous route. I was going to start with a historical, but I always feel history doesn't really present us with the noblest view, and therefore I'll sneak in history later. So, at the last talk, we were doing Plato's Republic, the arts, the spiritual arts, the training of the philosopher king, and I introduced an idea that the whole development of Platonic thought in the training of the philosopher king involves a very curious idea of measure. Because if you can grasp something, you've measured it. If you've grasped it, then you can define it. If you can define it, you can position it. Or locate it in a structure. That's what we talked about. Now I'm going to do the same thing. We're going to push the implications of it in terms of pseudo-Dionysius. First, let me see if I can get you into a little bit of Platonic arithmetic. Let's start this way. First, there is an ultimate, the good itself. The good itself is called the object of all of man's desires and all desire. It's the ultimate object of desire. When you want to consider it, therefore, in terms of an object of desire, you call it the good. If you want to talk about it of its intellectual side, you talk about it as the one. And they are metaphysically equivalent. Now, in terms of Platonic vision, the one overflows because it's so perfect that it overflows. There are three possibilities, of course. That overflowing could deplete itself, and then it would be less than itself because of the creation. It could be just even with itself, and therefore any creation that flowed from it would deprive itself of some of its own substance. Or it could be an overabundance of flowing. And that's the image that's used, an overflowing abundance. That's called the procession. And once it proceeds, it then, of course, returns to its source. And in that return, that's called the reversion. So therefore, there is something inherent in the one that overflows. Therefore, there's an imminent quality. It overflows. That's a procession. It returns back to its source. At that moment in returning to its source, it recognizes, it knows the nature of its source. Therefore, that comes into existence intelligence. Now, it's not a passive intelligence because it took all of this. This is a power. This is a power. This is a return of vast power. Therefore, it is vitality itself. And since what is encountered is not illusion, but the nature of reality, therefore, it is being. These three together are what is called, therefore, sometimes being, sometimes intelligence, And therefore, we have the good, or the one, because of its overflowing. This is a metaphysical creation. There comes into existence being, vitality, hyphenated intelligence. Now, the very same 
the very same dynamic takes place on that level and it too carries on the same kind of activity and it generates therefore soul world soul same thing takes place and then we have individual soul and body <clears throat> Now, the whole idea of Plato, the whole idea of the Platonic tradition is based upon just one idea. <clears throat> and that is, how can you understand the fact that there are times when we participate into something higher? To understand that is metaphysics. That's all it is. Platonic thought is nothing other than an intellectual approach to try to understand the very nature of the way in which we at times participate in things higher than ourselves. Next point. You see, we can now say, can we not, one thing which is different than a modern view. This is the essential difference between modern philosophy and classic philosophy in its simplest expression. The cause is always superior to its effect. So much so that the, the effect must always produce a likeness to its superior. A likeness. Never the same. A, it produces a likeness. But wait a minute, did we not say a moment ago that this is a series of causes and effects and causes and effects? That's right. Each one is overflowing. Each one, therefore, is a cause that produces the next one. Each one, therefore, is superior to the next one. That means there's a hierarchy. Necessarily, that means there's a hierarchy. If this is producing this, then this must be inferior to that, therefore this is superior to that. Good heavens, if this overflow is producing this, then this is superior to this. In a similar way, this is superior to this. Therefore, we have a hierarchy, necessarily a hierarchy based upon this one simple fact. Right? Each cause is superior to its effect. This is a cause, this is its effect. It in turn becomes a cause, and it produces its effect. It becomes a cause, it produces its effect. Therefore, to express that in one word, hierarchy. But you just got through saying the one procession was reversion, so it completes the closing the circle. That's right. From here, only from here. That produces this. This go turns around and produces that. This turns around and produces that. The same dynamic appears on each level. The Sufis call it, they, they use the symbol of the fountain. That's right, it is, that's exactly the same language, fountain. Yeah, fountain, overflowing fountain, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Now look here, would you not agree then that we can rank these therefore in terms of, all right, this, this is higher than that, this is higher than that, this is higher than that. Therefore, since the relationship between these two is a higher to a lower, and now that lower becomes a higher in respect to this, How could we express that simply? Ah, look here. The higher is to the lower. And that lower becomes a higher to its lower. Well, that's interesting. 
higher is to its lower, which in turn becomes a higher to its lower, well, then we have something like this then, don't we? We have this. A higher is to its lower, which in turn becomes a higher to its lower. Therefore, that middle term is a mean between the two extremes. That's a mean analogy. That's a mean analogy. That defines a mean analogy. Wait a minute. That means there must be, very simply said, however we decide on the quantities, that there must necessarily be a ratio between these two. A ratio, of course, is the way two things relate in some principle. Equally well, there must be some ratio between these and some ratio between these in a descending scale. Uh, like this, like this. Look here, let, 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 me, let me, look, it's, it's exactly like this then. A is to B as B is to C <clears throat> as C is to D as D is to E. See, that's a mean analogy. The mean terms being the same, just as we showed here. Ah, now we can take this as an analogy mean terms are the same. Hey, we can take this as an analogy. Mean terms are the same. Therefore, we have a descending scale of mean analogies, don't we? Now look at the principle behind each one of these. Now there is a principle behind each one of these because something emerges that has great vitality since it's capable of producing something and brings something into existence that formerly was in existence. That's a likeness to itself. That means, therefore, there is some... Now, here's the word ratio. It's a very curious word, right? I'm going to use the Greek for it, all right? Ratio. Logos. That's the logos. Which in the John, Gospel of John, in the beginning was the word. The word, that's logos. Same word, ratio. Therefore, inherent at each level, the way we can talk about each level, therefore, is that each particular division has its own unique logos. That takes on the form of uh, mean analogy. Now look here. What is it about a ratio, or logos, that's so interesting? Well, if it's an object, didn't we say a moment ago, it's the object of desire? On every level, there's an object of desire. The only reason it's an object of desire is obviously if you desire something, only desire it because it's good and beautiful. Otherwise, you wouldn't desire it. That means uh, surrounding each uh, logos is beauty, necessarily. For beauty is nothing other than manifestation of the good on a particular level. That's all. Now look here, would you not agree all we need is one more step, just to wrap this up a little bit? Anytime you see something that you recognize that's beautiful, and it inherently has intelligibility, and it sh foreshadows a, goo, a good in some hierarchical significance, you're attracted to it, and you want to get into it. You want to grab it. You want to embrace it. You want to share in it. You want to participate in it. Therefore, the power that pulls these things successively up and draws the person upward is eros, love. So therefore, the basic power behind the whole thing is not love divorced from beauty, but necessarily beauty is the thing which makes it so attractive and spurs us all into it. Right. The whole problem in philosophy is nothing else but to try to persuade people who haven't known it, or haven't seen it, or haven't experienced it, or haven't guessed it, that higher reality is more beautiful than the one you're in, wherever you are. That's all. And there ought to be some way of going successively from each one to the higher. 
And that's the training of the philosopher king, or the training of the philosopher in the Platonic tradition. Now this shows itself up in many, many great works of literature. The Platonic tradition started, as you know, way back in the days of Parmenides, continued all the way up. Now we're going into a little bit of history. We're not bringing history. The system spread, and then a new system came into history. Not entirely new, but sufficiently different to challenge it, and that was Christianity. Now, Christianity from the earliest days, we're talking about the second century on. This is the view of Christianity from the second century on to the 17th century. It's called parallel revelation. As you all know, the great game started with Moses. And following him were the prophets. <clears throat> all the way down, and you can put in some great figures, including Philo the Jew or Philo of Alexandria, whichever name you like to call him by. Then <clears throat> uh, Jesus, right? Uh, Paul. His companion, of course, was Dionysius. And there was Origen and Tertullian, and, and, and the list goes on. Oh, by the way, this is revelation based upon faith. Believe. Now from the second to the 17th century it was believed that parallel to this at the same time was Hermes Trismegetius. Pythagoras. And a whole line of Greek thinkers until you get to the more familiar names of uh, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. Now we can go on, get other names, Pausanias, um, not Pausanias, uh, yeah, well, Pausanias, but um, Cyrenius, um, <coughs> Plotinus, just to hit a couple of high ones. Um, Porphyry, Iamblichus, um, Proclus. In any case, parallel. This was called partial revelation because it was based upon reason. And that can explain why it is, and why it was, that so many of the teachings on this side could be anticipated over here, because it was a parallel revelation. One by reason, one by faith. Only this was argued to be far more complete, this was partial. Now what's interesting about this, as an example in the uh, days that followed in the mid 10th, 12th, 14th, 16th, 15th, 16th centuries, they argued even further that these people not only <clears throat> had a more fuller revelation, but they actually anticipated the philosophical tradition of the Greeks. Anticipated it. Had it before in a simplified but full form. And therefore, not only did they have a complete one, but on this side, they would say the Greeks had to struggle and work hard on reason and contemplation and use of the intellect to develop this, but it was only in principle partial and it wasn't full and complete as this is. Oh, by the way, a guy by the name of uh, 
Isaiah, Isaac Casabando, a Frenchman in the late 17th century, made a nice study and he said, by the way, this is uh, <clears throat> in principle wrong. Uh, these people, uh, Moses at 1200 to 1400 BC and Trismegidius looks like he's only at the most, the earliest you can get him is 100 BC and most likely 100 AD. And therefore it's not parallel. Well, that had, this created quite a blow. This created quite a blow to this theory. Because you see, at this point, you could teach both systems. Well, let's move on to another piece of history. This name, Dionysius, is honored. Because he was said to have been the companion of St. Paul. He wrote uh, several works, but among them are some great things called the Great Ten Letters, which is what we're going to talk about. One of the letters, the seventh, you see, describes being, being present, his being present at the crucifixion. And during the crucifixion, of course, there was a, an eclipse, and he describes it, and therefore he is kind of an eyewitness testimony, gives an eyewitness testimony to the crucifixion of Jesus. Very important figure. Now, in these letters and in his writings, I'd like to just read you an assessment of him by a very fine history of philosophy historian, Briere, a Frenchman, who did several volumes of very fine work on the classic age all the way up to the modern age. So I'm quoting now from the Hellenistic and Roman age. Uh, it's interesting, you can get it in paperback now. And I'm on uh, 247, right, so I read a paragraph. Now this is Briere's assessment of the contribution of Dionysius. His writings fall into two classes, the celestial hierarchy and the ecclesiastical hierarchy, which study the complete series of creatures capable of receiving divine revelation from the highest to the lowest. I'm skipping. The second includes divine names and mystical theology. The writings of Dionysius constitute a complete course in theology. Okay. That's the basis of Christian theology. He's the father of it all. Now, there's a very famous article on Dionysius by a chap by the name of Vanesti, V-A-N-N-E-S-T-E. And I'm going to again read something for you. He wants to talk about the uh, effect of this man's writings on the history of Christian thought. Um, Yeah, I don't want to call him that yet. Yeah, that, but you're absolutely correct. Um, so what happens when I don't underline something or make a note off of it? Um, okay, uh, you, you'll have to... I guess go along with my memory of this article since I don't want to take the time to find it. 
but um, Dionysius' works are like a catalyst both in theology and mysticism. Without them, the mystical life of the West would probably not have taken such a high intellectual turn. Their profound influence was on St. Thomas, and he talks about that. In St. Thomas Aquinas' works, there were three basic influences. He built the whole system on three, three works. and Albert the Great before him. Thomas used the Bible, of course, Aristotle, and Dionysius. He used them to such an extent that he quoted him in his writing 1,700 times. I would say that's owing quite a bit to an author. Albert the Great quotes him in his writings 1,100 times. His thought is so well structured and is the foundation of Christian metaphysics that they can easily use it and then build an entire system upon its foundations. Now. A chap by the name of Lorenzo Valla who if anyone ever can influence any movie production to make a film I would say that's the only man worthy of making a film of in the entire Western European tradition. He's more significant than any other person that I know of. I'll give you the reasons why I think that's true. Number one, right. he looked at the writings of Dionysius and he said, I can demonstrate that they could not have been written before 830 AD. The whole thing is a forgery. He did that in the late 15th century. Uh, interesting enough, the probable date for it is uh, 530 A.D. Now, a lot of authorities disagree about this date, and it goes up and down depending upon who you read. But most will accept somewhere between 530, 532, but not, not later. Some go earlier. Now, that's a very interesting date. You see, this entire system started with, formally with Plato, and he started his academy in Athens at 400 BC. It went on continuously, uninterrupted, until 529, when the Christian emperor, Justinian, said, look here, we cannot allow these philosophers to perpetuate their teaching. From this point on, there will be no public teaching of philosophy anywhere in the kingdom. And therefore, he closed down the schools where philosophy was part of a public instruction. The aristocrats could study it independently, but no public instruction of Platonic or pagan philosophy was allowed from this point on into Europe, and that brought on the Dark Ages. The people in the academy at that time because King Croesus of Syria intervened and said, we'll take them. And so the last remaining philosophers in Europe, Platonic philosophers, left Athens and they moved to Syria. Started many interesting things in Syria, which later became a center, by the way, for Islamic thought, and they continued the Platonic tradition there. It also went to Baghdad in the 10th century until the White Huns came down and destroyed it. Then it went moved into uh, Islamic thought again and moved into Islamic Spain where it flourished and then it was brought partially into Europe in the uh, 12th century, 11th century, 12th century, 13th century in a series of translations. Now look here. 
I am not interested in dates because of dating. But would you find it curious that they found these texts, Dionysius' text, in Syria at 530? <laughs> Suppose it turns out that the metaphysics of Dionysius is nothing other than this entire system of Platonic thought introduced into Christianity by various little subtle devices, changing of language here and there. Instead of calling intellect, pardon me, instead of calling this intelligence, vitality, and being, the realm of the angels. Same dynamics. Instead of talking about the good, the God. But he talks about him in such an interesting way. He defines God, Dionysius defines God as the good. He says God, comma, the good. Whenever he, most often when he uses it. In his writings, especially in the letters, he brings in all of the basic principles we've been talking here. He brings them in in a very fine and, and wonderful way because the arguments Dionysius uses turns out to have a one-to-one -one correspondence with Proclus. Proclus was 470 AD. Now, why would he do that? What's going on and what sense can we make of it? Now look here. This is rather curious, is it not? Let me offer a couple of suggestions, but before I do that, I want to make two more points here, and then we're going to move into the thought. All right. Lorenzo Valle did two other things that were really quite interesting. He got a copy, you see, in the 15th century, what was happening, they Everyone anticipated the fact that the last bastion of Greek civilization at Constantinople was about to crumble. The Turks or the Islamics had been trying to conquer that small little area that was still left of the classical age, and they were not able to. But the overwhelming forces were uh, imposing itself upon them for a final attack. And therefore, the Greeks living at that time, they put on boats the best of their scriptures, the best of their writings, their philosophical writings, mathematical writings, their medicine, all of that literature. And they put them on boats and sent them to that great city called Florence and started Plato's Academy once more, called Ficino's Plato Academy. For the first time, Europe got, for the first time, Europe got Europe, Latin-speaking Europe. They never had it before. They never had Plato before. They never had Plotinus, Proclus, any of this stuff. They had a couple of bastard translations, as they call them, of Plato's dialogue, the Phaedo, a very poor one of the Timaeus. So from 1495 on, Ficino and his school at Florence started a vast translation program, and they turned out work after work translated into Latin, and therefore the first time Europeans, Latin-speaking or Latin-based uh, people got into classical thought. They didn't have it before. It started then. Valla studied there. Right? Valla studied Greek. That was the thing to get into. Because they had been walking around ruins for years and couldn't, couldn't duplicate even the ruins. Now the, thought came, now the thought came into Europe and it woke up Europe and that was called the Renaissance which is a misnomer, so they, 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 never, they never had a birth before, so they couldn't have a rebirth. That's what Renaissance means. Now, you know what's interesting now, you see, is when this literature came in, they also brought with them early Greek Bibles. Now, the Bible was written in Greek, Old and New Testament, right? Hebrew Bible what was not intelligible to the vast number of Jews. They all spoke Greek. They didn't speak Hebrew. Hebrew was already a dead language in the second century BC. Therefore, they translated the Septuagint into Greek that early. The New Testament is in Greek. The Latin world, Europe, the Latin world, only had a Latin translation of the Bible called the Vulgate. 
sometimes called St. Jerome's Translation. Lorenzo Valla got a copy of this Greek text and he wrote his friend Erasmus and said, we're facing a great crisis. I just compared the Latin, our Bible, the Latin Vulgate edition with the Greek edition and I'm a I have to tell you something terrible, he said. There's so many differences between the two that we're facing a crisis of the faith. This shocked them so much that they did not publish the findings. They just sent it around in letters to all of the major Renaissance thinkers. So slowly the word got out. Now, Rensselaer did one more thing, and I'd like to add that to the drama. <clears throat> now, uh, you may be able to draw a better map than I, because I always, for some curious reason, end up drawing Greece much more bigger and all that than other countries, and I don't know why I do that, but all right. All right. Now look here. The Roman Empire was divided into two parts. The Latin speaking, the Greek speaking. Because it was so unmanageable. That's the way they broke it up in the third century. When Emperor Constantine became emperor of Rome, he saw again and again from past history that the Europeans coming down here, <clears throat> what were the Europeans called in those days? Barbarians. barbarians, right, they were the barbarians. They were sacking Rome again and again and again and he looked at the area and he said, look here, this is an indefensible place, you can't defend it. Once you break through the Alps, there's no natural defense line. So he came up with a brilliant idea. He said, you know what we should do? We should move the capital of the, of the Roman Empire that's the Black Sea, and over here is the Caspian Sea, right? He said, let's move the Roman Empire's capital from Rome to this little jutting land here. It's a peninsula because there's deep marshes along this side. It makes it absolutely impossible to be attacked by land. If we're attacked by sea in this way, it doesn't make any difference. We can get supplies this way. And this, of course, you know, is the Bosporus. And he said, anytime anyone tries to attack us this way, we can just con construct a link chain across that, and no ships will be able to attack us. So therefore, it was virtually impregnable. They built a great city, Constantinople. Oh, by the way, when Emperor Constantine left, he had to leave someone in charge. So he made up this beautiful document which, by the way, the church rolled out for many, many years uh, during public demonstrations. And it's called the Donation of Constantine. In it, you see when Emperor Constantine left, he turned to the Church of Rome and he said, I am going to create a pope. And I'm going to bequeath to him all of the powers necessary to manage all of the lands to the west of that line. We will maintain to the east. In this beautiful document, he said, therefore, I bequeath not only the right of the Pope to be the final arbitrator of all affairs, both legal and ecclesiastical, but I give him the right to raise taxes, hold armies, hold lands, be responsible, therefore, for the coronations of kings. Before that, it didn't exist. And therefore, he has the absolute right over this entire area, and that started the Great War in Europe for hundreds and hundreds of years, called the battle between the church and state. This document. Oh, what does this have to do with Lorenzo Valla? <laughs> he took a look at it, and he said, gentlemen, I want to make a small point about this after looking at it. Uh, it's a forgery. It could not have been uh, made before around 18, about 850. It was never written at the time of Constantine. That was 300 AD. The whole thing's a forgery. So he did three things. Therefore, a short while later, a young chap by the name of Luther came along and said, let's see, the Bible is gone. We have the Greek text. We need a new Bible. 
wait a minute, why do we have to hold on and believe in the Pope and his offices and his councils? They're based upon this document. Therefore, there's no legal right to hold us and bind us to the Church of Rome. That's gone. Metaphysics. What do we have to worry about metaphysics for? It was designed by a pagan. Dionysius. So therefore, he redefined Christian faith based upon conscience, didn't he? One man did it, Lorenzo Valla. Pardon? I didn't hear. Based on Luther. Based upon Luther? I hope. Pardon? Conscience. Conscience. Oh, conscience? Yes, conscience. Oh, conscience. Conscience, didn't we? Conscience. <laughs> right? Every man has his conscience. That's a sufficient basis to guide your spiritual life. You don't need the ecclesiastical. You don't need the hierarchy. You don't need the church. You don't need the sacraments. You don't need the paraphernalia of Rome. Do you not? Yeah. So therefore, Dionysius' name was changed to Pseudo. Right? Pseudo Dionysius. Pardon me? Yeah. Yeah, that's where he got his name, Suda Dionysius. Now, so I told you I'd get back into the history. All right, yes, please. In other words, Suda was false. So yes, false Dionysius. Dionysius was actually who? No one knows who wrote it. But oh. it was written, it looks like, a year after they closed Plato's Academy and it was found in Syria where it happens just by accident, the philosophers went. Now, some of you, I suspect, are thinking that maybe one of those crazy Platonists whipped up the letters of Dionysius and the writings of Dionysius to preserve and continue the Platonic tradition in the church. Is that right? Well, all we have to do, all we have to do is see to what degree can we say that this thought that we represented here is in Dionysius. If it is, how did he do it? All right. Now, I thought you'd like that historical introduction. And now I'd like to tell you about the ten letters. All right, ten letters. I gave you a sheet, ten letters. Now, if you have time someday to get a good book and you want to get into this in some detail, I strongly recommend you get the book The Hierarchy and the Definition of Order in the Letters of Pseudo Dionysius by Hathaway. You're going to have to repeat that. Well, it's there on the bottom of the page. Oh, okay. I see it. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. Yes, I do. Didn't you get one? Excuse me. I beg your pardon. Yeah, let me make sure you get that. It's, it's also good for a Christmas gift. It uh, makes good Christmas cards if you fold them over. Right. Give it to the right person. Yes, yes, it's a good gift. I think so. I don't know. Even though it's a joke, it's quite serious. Now, what I'm going to do now is summarize some of the points that Hathaway has made. Right, he's a very fine scholar. He plays the violin beautifully, by the way. Right. And he makes the following points, and he can show why it is that they are the way they are. And it's not part of my thesis that I'm going to present to you. Therefore, I'm just going to summarize them so I can do what I want to do. All right, first thing he says. These ten letters bear a very close relationship to Parmenides. If you take Parmenides, Plato's Parmenides, and he has what are called the nine hypotheses. All right? And guess what they are? The first, second, third, fourth, fifth, the first is called the one. The second has been given the name intelligence, being, etc. Soul, body and soul. And matter, or unformed, non-living, right? Two, three, four, five. 
And then there's the denial of these. The denial of the second, the denial of the third, the denial of the fourth, the denial of the fifth. That is to say, he whips out a great metaphysics where he shows you can understand the nature of the one. He gives you the logic and the tools necessary to understand intellectually intelligence, the soul, body and soul, matter. And then these are the arguments against it, which, to, which is a rejection of each of those points in the sequence that I just made. So, one is pure, stands alone. Two, you can actually, if you'd like to see it in a figure, I think of it in a figure and I'd like to share that with you. Stay there. You can put the second, third, fourth, and fifth hypothesis, which represents each one of these, and their denial Therefore, you can study both how to affirm it and how to deny it, how to affirm it, how to deny it. Then you can see the relationships going any number of ways you want. It's extremely well organized. And each one of these can be re represented in this uh, great structure. Now, Plotinus comes along, the great Neoplatonist. And he spends all his time trying to explain how you can make the transition between each one of these realms. And he does it with great, great uh, clarity and beauty. And that's called the Aeneids. These, as we said a moment ago, are hierarchically arranged. There's a hierarchical order. Um, Proclus does the astonishing. Proclus is the only, by the way, he's the only systematic thinker in the history of Europe, and he's never studied. No one studies him. Proclus is totally amazing. Totally amazing. He develops a rational system that makes clear every idea that's built by Plato and Plotinus, and he puts it in a beautiful intellectual system called the Elements of Theology. That's what he calls it, the Elements of Theology. And I footnoted that for you at the bottom of the page. Now, if you were to get the book, if you were to get the book, Proclus's Elements of Theology. And do you see those numbers, the propositions, 2, 23, 27, 28, 46, 64, 65, 100, 103, right, 148, 151, right, 185, 103, uh, two, no, 200, 203, right? If you just studied those, you could then go back into Pseudo-Dionysius and you could go line by line and you can say, ah, ah, restatement, restatement, quote, restatement, quote. But with this first, let's go back, all right? Now, how does the letters represent this? According to Hathaway, and he does a beautiful job, he says, you can take the first letter, you can put the letters right along here. <laughs> Pseudo-Dionysius took Plato's metaphysics. Dionysius took the Parmenides, this vast structure, and he represents each one of these great hypotheses, as they're called, by addressing a letter to four monks uh, you know what he does? Then a minister and then a priest
and then a bishop and then another one to a general bishop over the entire area. So you have five, six, seven, eight, nine, and the tenth one, which is special. Now Dionysius is going to do one basic thing over and over again in these ten letters. He's going to try to demonstrate to presumably the person to whom he sent the letter, he's going to try to demonstrate that in order to bring around a natural justice in the church and in its functioning, you have to have these people arranged in a hierarchical order. So he develops a very interesting way of reasoning to show that this is, in fact, a hierarchical order. And by the way, each time he develops one of these, guess what? It's one of the major ideas that represent this hierarchical order. That's what makes the church. That's right. So he, you see, by arguing for the church necessarily having this hierarchy, the need for it, the arguments he uses <laughs> comes from, comes from Proclus's need to say that these principles are hierarchical. He transfers the reasoning from his metaphysical system that justifies the hierarchy, the very same reasons, the very same arguments he uses in each one of these letters. That's right. And Plato's Republic. First one starts with Plato's Republic. So yes, you can also take the first, the third, the fifth, the seventh, the ninth letters and put them parallel with Plato's Republic. That's another way of doing it. That's true. You can do that too. Yeah. So the guy's immensely clever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but wait a minute. There's something missing here. And this is called the problem. And that's what I wanted to talk about a little bit tonight. The problem. Why does pseudo Dionysius, or Dionysius, why does he bring in a monk? And he breaks the whole order. I mean, he's violating the hierarchical order. This is very strange. I mean, what's he doing it for? Very sad to see. Unless he's doing something interesting. Unless he's doing something interesting. Can you share how that, how, how it's a problem? Well, is this, the, is this the order? Yes or no? One, two, three, four. And the last one, by the way, is addressed to John, the apostle, the evangelist. Does that look like a hierarchy? Does it? No. Yeah, well, look here. Just do, follow me. Four monks. There are four grades of monks, by the way. Minister, priest, bishop, countrywide bishop, John the Apostle, the Apostle Evangelist. Does that look a, like a hierarchy? Yeah. Yeah, except for one thing. What's in here? A monk. Yeah, it's out of whack. It's out of whack. That's a problem doesn't fit. The eighth is a monk. Something's wrong. Agree? Doesn't fit. Yeah. Therefore, all the speculation on, on pseudo-Dionysius then is, what is the significance? What is he doing? What is he doing in the eighth letter? Therefore, I brought along the eighth letter. I thought I'd read you parts of it and see whether we can then have a little fun with it. All right. Eighth letter is the monk. What did I put in the wrong one? Yeah, oh, excuse me, that's eight. Tenth is uh, John, the apostle. Now, the, uh, 
just while I'm getting the material out, please look at the note on uh, uh, the ninth. Symbolic theology. He has developed in the ninth letter how to understand all the sum, how to take the whole Bible, how to take the Bible, pull out all of its major terms that describe God. He shows you how you can understand each one of them analogically, so you don't take it literally. And therefore, he can then bring intellectual order into the whole thing and escape anthropomorphism. He can escape all of the consequences of taking scriptures literally. Because one of the things that Dionysius did, which is really very creative, so if I can give you one more name here, Philo from Alexandria or Philo the Jew. <clears throat> now, if you want a good book to look into this, I would recommend this book, um, Hellenism and Judaism. By Hangel. It's a two, two volume work. Beautiful piece of work. He studies Hellenism and the Holy Lands, talks about it, has great sources, brings it together. But, all right, take that as a background. Let's go back to Philo. Philo was a Jewish philosopher, and he saw that the Old Testament is anthropomorphic and it allowed a certain kind of identi identification with Judaism, and that identification didn't allow them to be more cosmopolitan. At this time, by the way, there are more Jews living in Alexandria than they were in the Holy Land. Right? They had been spreading around throughout the Mediterranean. And therefore, he began speculating on the following thought. He said, <clears throat> how is it that the Greeks are able to keep Homer, with all the anthropomorphisms, with all that strange uh, behavior of the gods, how can they keep their, their theology their mythology while still being rational. How did the culture develop an entire intellectual system with intellectual values of the highest degree and have a religion based upon Homer, based upon a crude mythology? So what he did is he started reading all of the people who were commenting on Homer and he found the allegorical method. He said, that's what the Greeks have done. They have through the use of analogy and using the, ana the uh, allegorical method. He changed it into an allegory. He said, I know how to deal with it now. I will do with the Jewish Bible exactly what the Greeks did with Homer. Set up a structure of analogies, treat it as an allegory, and therefore we can be just like the Jews, upon me will be just like the Greeks, we'll allegorize the whole thing, and therefore show it as an intellectual direction and we don't have to take it literally, and we can free ourselves from all the anthropomorphisms. And that's what he did in six volumes. Dionysius did the same thing, see. He went to the Old Testament and the New Testament. He pulled out all of the terms, and he did what Philo the Jew did, only he did it on the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. And when you read that, the key for doing that, the key for doing it is only in 10 pages. And that's letter number nine, called symbolic theology. Today that's called hermeneutics, a hermeneutic principle that allows you to understand how to take those terms and understand them in non-literal terms and how to do it. So that's the ninth letter, very beautiful letter. Um, Ah, here we are. I have an extra copy of the letters if someone would like them after. But it's Xerox, but you should get the book. Um,
I'm going to just read a few things first to, to show you how he links the idea of God with the good and the language he uses in order to build up an argument. All right, that's what I'm going to do. He who holds converse with God, comma, the good, must model himself most of all on the likeness of the good in so far as attainable and must know in his own conscience, in his own deeds, performed out of the love of the good. Likeness, hmm, the good, model, the steps up are modeling. You model each successive level. What made David a friend of God, only the fact that he was good, even good to his enemies. I have found a real man after my own heart, says he who is the lover of the good and who transcends good. A good law was laid out even for enjoying the care of one's enemy's oxen. Now, consider Paul, everything that Paul said. What, is, what does Jerusalem have to do with Athens? I remember all the statements about Pauline theology. You have them in your mind. Notice Dionysius now. The word of God celebrates all good men who neither suspected nor did evil things, nor followed those changing from goodness because of the evils of others, but who, on the contrary, follow those who made the evil good and simple in a divine way, giving to them their own manifold goodness and reasonably summing, pardon me, and reasonably summing them to its likeness. But let us raise ourselves to that which is above, praising neither meekness of saintly men nor the good deeds of men-loving angels who take compassion on nations and plead for the good of their behalf, nor, and I'm skipping, nor praising other things regarding the good, deals, de, the good deeds of angels, such as the word of God, but, but receiving in peace the good, bringing rays of the really good and transgood Christ. Let us raise on these to his divine good works. This is not a sign. Is, is this not a sign of goodness beyond speaking and above knowing? that he made beings to be. Yeah, that's what it is. The one made being. Right? Made the beings of being. And having led all things, right? and having led all things into being, that he wills all things eternally to be like himself and to have things in common with him, each according to its own aptitude. See, he's now going to go on a whole thesis of light and Proclus is going to say in this structure that one way to look at this as this is light descends, beatific light, divine radiance and luminosity spreads through the whole. <clears throat> That's the bind that keeps all the universe together. Therefore he's going to use images of light, Dionysius is going to use images of light, radiance, the sun, Contrary wise, you're going to use the cave and darkness. And we're going to say, hey, I know that language that comes out of the allegory of the cave. That's right, he's using it in his back pocket the entire time. Now, He's going through a whole, a whole argument about the fact that there's a certain priest that denies, the, denies uh, a parishioner the opportunity to convert because that parishioner previously had stolen some things. And I'm skipping that. It's a very beautiful story because I want to get to this point. He's now looking at this entire list, the ministers, the priests, the bishops, John the, uh, John the evangelist, each class of beings around God 
is more divine in form than that which stands further away. And those nearer the true light are more full of light and able to shed light. Now don't take the nearness in a special sense, but according to the sense of the aptitude of each class for receiving the gift of God. For each class has an aptitude and a receptivity to the unfolding effluence and light. To the degree they have a capacity for it, they merge with it on a higher level. Have you noticed how often he's talking about sin? About faith? About uh, post-resurrection? Nothing. It's the great Dionysia. It's, it's not one line in the ten letters of it. But each class of beings around God, let's just talk about each class. To speak plainly, in all beings there's a distribution from the first to the second by a well-ordered and most just providence for all. Consequently, it is those who have been arranged by God to rule over others who must distribute what is fitting first to themselves and then to their inferiors. Therefore, that overflowing, this, the whole order, is nothing other than the unfolding of, here's the new word, providence. Has nothing to do with conversion, has nothing to do with sin, has nothing to do with repentance, has to do with one's ability to be receptive to the unflowing light from the higher levels of reality. And now he's going to go into now he wants to now talk about how all this relates to the soul of man so he's going to get a hierarchy in the soul of man and he's going to have reason he's going to have passion he's going to have appetites and that comes right out of Plato's Republic how shall we shall, how shall we not be ashamed then if we overlook it when reason is treated unjustly by anger and passion an exile from the rule provided by God when we arouse an unjust and unholy lack of order, insurrection and chaos in ourselves. Basic rule. It's improper for one who has not set his own house in order to govern the house of God. For he has governed himself, will govern another. He who governs another will govern a house. He who governs a house, a city also. And who governs a city, a nation. And that comes out of Plato's Republic. Okay, let me give another one. Very interesting. This is that story I mentioned before. But you, having met that fellow who was beginning to look up towards illumination, and having given him a blow to the cheek as he was coming towards you in much modesty, you boldly spurned him. He, the very man for whom Christ in his goodness was looking when wandering on the mountain, and whom he calls when fleeing, and whom he takes as soon as found on his shoulders, let us not then, I beg you, let us take counsel. Let us, let us not, I beg, let us not take counsel badly on our own behalf or turn the sword against ourselves. For those who undertake to injure anyone, or on the contrary, to take their true welfare in hand, do not always accomplish the things they desire by associating themselves with evil or with good. Therefore, for this reason, I'm 
An eager desire is roused in us for God, the good. And always to be with the Lord, and not to be marked off together with evil away from the most just. To endure there what is fitting for us in our own natures. There isn't one line in this entire work that deals in any way with a Pauline doctrine. Have I given enough quotes to at least raise the possibility that what he is doing is taking this entire work and translating Neoplatonic thought into Christian metaphysics? Because I want to go one more step yeah, please. I have a book by James Price. He shows where the book of Revelation mm -hmm. is taken almost word for word right out of Plato. Yeah. The whole book of Revelation comes right out of Plato. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <clears throat> okay. I would now like to go into... Uh, okay, no, remember now, we have not in any way dealt with why it's there. Why eight, the monk is there. But clearly that monk is talking in the language that we're now familiar with, aren't we? Yes, all letter eight. All letter eight. All letter eight. There is one sentence in Pseudo Dionysius's writings that just stands out and he says, the monk, the highest monk, is preparing himself for philosophy and intellectual contemplation. <laughs> and that's number eight. Because all of those quotes you can find in Proclus with those references I just gave, and I'd like to read one or two so you can see the style of his thinking. Therefore, that monk is preparing himself for the philosophical life and contemplation. What does that mean then? How then is philosophy and Greek metaphysical thought being introduced into Christian metaphysics? How is it being positioned? What is Dionysius doing? Well, you know what? I was going to go into symbolic theology for a minute, but I'm going to go to the tenth letter, read the tenth letter for you. Okay? Because I like it so much. And it's very short. And I can read the whole thing, which is another value to it. I got it. Never mind. I didn't think the. Yeah. Okay. I was worried about that wire reaching a distance. Okay. Letter ten. To John the theologian, the apostle, the evangelist, in exile on the island of Patmos. I address your holy soul, O beloved one, and it is my privilege to be closer to you than others. First point, right? Closer to him than to others. Greetings, truly beloved, especially beloved of that which is really the object of love, desire, and affection. What is remarkable in the fact that Christ proclaims the truth and the unjust drive his disciples from their cities when they are unjust 
and are giving themselves what they deserve. And the accursed are separating themselves from the holy and are departing from them. Principle. Truly things visible are manifest signs of the invisible. That's one of the ratios. The visible stands to the invisible in a ratio. Nor will God be the cause of the just separations of men from himself. But they will wholly separate themselves, themselves, just as we see others here in this world living with God because they are lovers of the truth, because they withdraw from the material involvements of the passions and desire peace and all freedom. As regards you, I am not so mad as to think that you suffer anything. But I believe that you perceive the affections of the body only according to the extent to which you distinguish them. Although those who think to harm you and banish you do not correctly punish the son of the evangelum. I pray for the remission of those who are harming themselves to convert them to good so that you might draw them back to share in your light. <clears throat> the word your is put in by the translator. It could be left out. For my part, all right, here's the conclusion. For my part, nothing contrary deprives me of the light full ray of John. For the present we shall read these writings in the memory and the renewal of this, your true teaching about God. And in short, while I say it, though it be audacious, we shall be joined to you. I am trustworthy concerning the things prophesied of God about you. I am trustworthy concerning the things prophesied of God about you. Having both learned and then stated that you will leave the prison on Patmos, that you will return to Asia Minor and there produce imitations of the good God and leave them to posterity. What is he claiming? At the present we shall re read these writings, his own writings, these writings, in the memory and the renewal of this, in the memory and the renewal of this, uh, uh, right? In the memory and the renewal of uh, your teachings about God. What kind of a claim is that? For the present, we shall read these writings in the memory and renewal of this, your teachings about God. And we shall be joined to you. I'm trustworthy concerning the things prophesied to God about you, having learned and then stated that you leave the prison on Patmos, that you will leave the, the prison, and you'll return to Asia Minor, and there produce imitations of the good. Okay. He's prophesying, is he not? He believes that these writings are going to be continued. These writings are the philosophical statements from the Platonic tradition. Isn't it through memory too? Yeah. Yeah. Therefore, what's number 10 doing? These writings, these writings, he believes are going to be continued. We shall, future, we shall read these writings in the memory and renewal of your own teachings. That's rather curious, isn't it? We're going to read these writings in memory and renewal of this, your teachings. Then we're going to read all of these writings in view of your teaching. And I prophesy, he says, that we'll be joined to you and uh, I'm trustworthy concerning the things prophesied to God about you.
It worked. It worked, didn't it? They incorporated these teachings into the church's doctrines. He saw it. He, he saw it at the time of writing it. And therefore, he brought in the Platonic tradition into Christian metaphysics. So he's writing to make this like the time of the Dean of Dionysus that they thought. Of, That's right. The time of Christ. That's right. So he's predicting yeah. exactly what he's doing. Yeah. So he's predicting what he's doing 500 years later, as it were. Clever? Oh. Immensely oh. clever. Yeah, a lot of people for Only. A thousand years. <laughs> Sorry, I got <laughs> right. 1,300 years. Right. You know, the damage is, of course, that it now, uh, uh, now valid did his work at the last part of the 15th century. But the Catholic Church didn't accept those that those findings until 1895 when another scholar, a German, decided to do a similar work and then they accepted it. So this year, 1995, is the 100th year anniversary of the church's acceptance that this work was a forgery. <laughs> but the damage was, you see, that kind of speculation, that kind of contemplative activity which was at one time allowed for monks. That's how it survived. <clears throat> lost its favor. Interesting enough, though, it's very rich, and they can forget it, and they can reject it, but we don't have to. It's a great piece of writing. It takes that metaphysics and brings it into the human dimension. Was it about 1895? Stigelmeyer, yeah, Stigelmeyer yeah. did it. <clears throat> Pardon? Pardon me? Isn't that one of the first modern translations of Plato? Use a lot of yes, yes, yeah, yeah, same days. Yeah, within that. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's nine o'clock. Well, now the Constantine of the the legacy of Constantine. Donation of Constantine. Said it's a forgery. Yes, that's a forgery. So the Dionysius forgery. Right. Well, but, how did, who came up with the Constantine thing? Mm -hmm. go, okay. But he discovered that too. On Ford, yes. Wouldn't that make a great movie? Yeah. The whole all those I mean, over to there. be able to dramatize that and the struggle and the impact and the social impact on it, religious mm -hmm. impact on it, what it did to the universities, what it did to the Catholic Church. Immense. Would it be a great story? It'd be a great story. What about the area of that's what he's called. Pseudo Dionysius the Arabian. Yeah. And his works are called the Corpus Aragatium. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining me. I'll take any questions from the floor. You have all the dates right, right? This writing is designed as if it were written at the time of Paul, right? Because in the seventh letter, he makes the claim that he was present at the crucifixion. But according to the evidence, it was only written at 530, 530 AD. People accepted it from that point on as authentic. Though there was a battle, by the way, there was also a battle about it. But oh. no, okay, all right. Therefore, look, this is not an easy sentence to read, all right. And maybe you should read it yourself, but I'll read it again. For the present, right, presumably that's a uh, ninety A.D. For the present, we shall read these writings, his writings, 
in the memory and renewal of this, your teachings. We will take these writings in the memory and renewal of your teachings. Whose teachings? His, his, he's John. John the, John the Apostle. So John the Apostle to the Gospel of John and pres presumably the uh, Revelations. Because when he says the island of Patmos, traditionally that's where the Revelations was written. Oh yeah, John, that's true. John's. Yeah, if you put the dates down, it makes it pretty impossible because the most good number of scholars put the date on the Revelations to be 110 A.D. And if it's John, and then if he was 30 at the time when he met Jesus, right, that would make him 110 when he wrote it. And, and, and the a number of years you put on top of that makes him even older. So. It's a, some German scholars put it up to 120. There's a battle in all of this, minus and plus 10 years, by the way. Except for the Gospels, there's a minus and plus of about two years. So for the present, we shall read these writings in the memory and renewal of yours. Now, <coughs> what, you know what that means? That means if you take the Revelations, and what are you going to do with them? And the Gospel of John. If you take these writings, his own, in the memory of Revelations, you know what you're going to do? You're going to treat it, the entire work of the Revelations, through symbolic theology, that's the ninth letter, and you'll then generate a Proclus metaphysics. That's what you do. Because the ninth letter is the work on symbolic theology, how to take all of the symbols how to take all the symbols and treat them rationally as a structure, an intellectual structure. So if you take his writings and in memory of what John is doing, you know what you're going to do with the Revelations? You're going to intellectualize it and remove all the anthropomorphic elements. And that's what they did. Clever piece of work, isn't it? Amazing. Pardon? Somebody should tell the evangelists they're talking about revelation, things are going to happen. Yeah. Is there something in the future that's all happened already? Yeah. <laughs> well, it always happens. <laughs> yeah, good. Yes, please. I'm just still confused about the placement of the, that the monk that's out of place. That's right. That's right. Okay. Two things, all right? One is, one of the key quotes of Dionysius is that the higher, the, the higher vocation of the monk is to prepare him for philosophy, for an intellectual contemplation of the good. So these are, what this is called, these four are called basic theology, which I indicated there. This is placed here because He's breaking up this order and making a claim for the role of philosophy, isn't it? Or Procolean metaphysics. In book 10, he's saying, look, now that I showed you how to understand symbolic material, you can use my writings to understand John's revelations. Clever? I'm just underscoring basically how important Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, his other two works are immensely interesting, you know, uh, mystical theology. Alan Watts, by the way, did a very fine translation of the mystical theology, which Dionysius wrote, which I have up here. And uh, so do some other people. But, uh, thank you.